I once heard someone say that when an elderly person passes away, an entire library of our history dies with them. Indeed, I also believe the same is true with old historic buildings. Each year, one by one, they're either torn down in the name of progress or slowly disappear from lack of upkeep. Either way, once they're gone, the incredible history that they bore witness to slips away. Like many of you, I believe we need to do all we can to document these histories and preserve them for future generations. I mean, really, I can't help myself. Each time I stumble across a historic building, I always ponder its history. What role did it play in people's lives? And who were the people who invested their hopes and dreams into these buildings? Recently, I stumbled across an abandoned hotel in the small town of Bulls Gap, Tennessee. This place was once a bustling center of activity as trains stopped here several times a day during the late 18 and early 1900s. Now, this building sits forgotten and slowly fallen in on itself. Oh, but its story's not lost yet. And today, I'd like to share it with you. So, with that, my friends, this is the true story of the Gillies Hotel in Bulls Gap, Tennessee. Our story begins in the early 1870s. You see, Bulls Gap was once a major intersection for the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad. In fact, they had two separate railroads and several railroad spurs running right through this small town. Now, many of these trains would stop in Bulls Gap. In fact, the town gained a reputation for being a breakfast and supper stop for trains traveling from Morristown to Knoxville and beyond. That's when a man named Celeste B. Austin saw an opportunity to open a hotel and capitalize on the booming train industry. Now. This hotel would change ownership a couple of times over the next few decades before it was finally purchased for $16,000 by a man named R.H. Gilly. When Mr. Gilly purchased the hotel, he had a curious little girl named Ruby. And Ruby spent her entire childhood living in this hotel. Now, this was the golden age of the roaring 20s. And Ruby spent most of her days greeting each train that would stop in Bull's Gap. She would help the travelers get to her daddy's hotel. All the while, she was admiring their fancy dresses and hats that the women wore and the fancy suits of the businessmen. The lobby in the front porch of the hotel had many big rocking chairs, and most of the hotel guests would relax in the lobby while talking about business affairs and the stock market and the news of the day. But all that stuff just bored Ruby so she would always hang out on the front porch. That's where the railroad workers would gather each evening, playing authentic Appalachian music on guitars and jugs and, heck, even saws. Some of these railroad workers were some of the best musicians that Ruby had ever heard in her life. They could put many of the local musicians to shame. Once the music had died down around sunset each evening, there were plenty of master storytellers telling stories of things they had seen riding the railroad through the untamed Appalachian Mountains. Ruby would sit quietly, wide-eyed, hanging on every word, and she soaked up the stories like a sponge. In many ways, Ruby learned about the entire world right there on that front porch. Each morning, Ruby would help out in the kitchen in the hotel. She would help pack the railroad workers' lunches for the day, and she would deliver them to the trains before they departed for faraway places like Greenville and Morristown and Knoxville. After breakfast, Ruby would set the tin tables in the dining room. She learned just where to put the soup spoons and where to put the big forks. She took pride in setting up these tables. Right at lunch each day, Ruby would follow the dining room girl as she carried a brass bell to the porch of the hotel and rang it three times. This was a signal that it was time for lunch. Folks would come from everywhere to go to Gilly's Hotel, even the local folks that lived in Bull's Gap. As the years went by, all of the railroad workers knew Ruby. There was the Englishman, Bert Lord, who had 
the house of the Lords on his hotel door. Then there was Arthur Wilson, a railroad engineer who had been severely burned in an accident. And who could forget Jimmy Johnson, the conductor who had part of his ear missing, and old Curtis Grant, who Ruby called the governor. Then there was Sherwood Johnson, who always liked playing tricks on everybody, and even Frank Hall, the conductor who liked to take Ruby fishing. These folks were Ruby's friends. And although Ruby had never left Bull's Gap in her entire life, she had learned of the entire world through these railmen's adventures and travels. Now, there were other adventures at the hotel as well. One day, Ruby's daddy got the idea to install a movie theater in the basement of the hotel. Now, you have to keep in mind that this was in the days of silent movies, and this was the first ever movie theater in Bull's Gap. On opening night, folks were so overwhelmed with the technology of this moving picture, one man fell over backwards and fainted. It wasn't long before Ruby's daddy was the subject of fiery preacher sermons all over Bull's Gap, talking about the evils of this moving picture technology and how it was corrupting the mortality of mankind. One day, as Ruby watched out the window, all the preachers gathered at the hotel and demanded that this evil movie theater be destroyed at once. So, Ruby's dad had to close the movie theater, and instead, he rented the space out to a doctor's office. In 1969, Ruby's dad died, and the hotel was sold. Just like that, it was the end of an era. The hotel changed hands a few more times, before finally becoming an apartment building, before being abandoned. Although many people would like to see this building saved and restored, yeah, it's very unlikely. It's been more than a hundred years since Ruby moved into this hotel in the 1920s and spent her entire life here. I was granted permission to film the inside of Gilly's Hotel, and as I was filming, I could see the visitors checking in at the main desk. I could smell desserts being prepared in the kitchen. Guests were busy as a bee walking to and from their rooms. Eating meals in the dining room. I saw them hurrying down the stairs with their luggage, making sure not to miss the train that was waiting outside. However, more than anything else, I could feel a presence inside of this building, some sort of energy near me in every room that I went in. Perhaps, just maybe, it was the spirit of a curious little girl wondering who the latest visitor to her home was. Thank you for watching this video and your support of the preservation of Appalachian history. You can support this channel by going to theappalachianstoryteller.com.